Hi guys, in this lesson we're going to take a look at the McCabe Thiel method. So the McCabe Thiel method is a graphical method for solving the material balance equations and equilibrium relationships within a distillation column. Now we're going to outline the simple procedure in order to construct this diagram here. So we'll see how we can plot all the necessary points and we can use this graph in order to determine several different parameters that are associated with a distillation column. Now there are other methods that we discuss in our online course so I'll put a link in the description to those methods and that course uh, for you to check out. Now in this lesson we're going to look at the design procedure for this but we will have subsequent videos on actually solving this uh, graph with a analytical question. So the first thing that we're going to do is plot the vapour liquid equilibrium curve from the data that would be available based at the operating uh, pressure. Now the data can be given by experimentation, it can be given by the manufacturer um, so that's what we will plot this line here. That is our operating and equilibrium line. So we have this dashed line here and then we have this 45 degree angle here. Now if the data is in the form of relative volatility then we have another video that goes into what relative volatility actually is as well as the K value. So I'll put a link in the description to that video as well. Now if our information is based on alpha then what we have to do is we basically take the geometric mean for the relative volatility of the most volatile component. That's what MVC stands for. And the equation that we use to relate y in terms of x, because here we have y equals x. So that would be whatever the value of x is, the value of y will be the same. However, with the relative volatility, we have to use this expression here, and that accounts for the value for the most volatile component. So that will give us the vapor liquid equilibrium line that we require. Now, we then use an overall mole balance on the column to find the top and the bottom compositions XD and XB. So here we would do a mass balance. So we'd have our distillation column with our feed coming in. We would have our top product and we would have our bottom product. And by performing a mass balance on a distillation column, that will give us the compositions of the top stream and the bottom stream. And we can also know what um, percentage of composition the feed is in as well. And that's very important for being able to start to solve the McCabe Thiel method after we plot the system. Now we do have a extensive mass and energy balance course that I'll also put a link in the description. This is a fantastic course that basically that will tell you everything that you need to know to be a successful chemical engineer at mass and energy balances. So be sure to check that one out. Now, step three is the enriching and the stripping section operating lines will intersect the diagonal, so that's our 45 degree line at the respective compositions XD and XB. That's for enriching and that's for stripping. So enriching is the top, stripping is the bottom. And then we mark the two points on the diagram. Then the fourth step is that the point of intersection of the two operating lines is then dependent on the phase condition of the feed. And the line in which the intersection occurs is known as the Q line. Now the Q line gradient is found by this equation here. So this is that the heat that is needed in order to convert one mole of the feed into saturated vapour divided by the latent heat of one mole of the feed. So what this means is if we have a feed that contains a mixture of vapour and liquid, then this would be the amount of heat needed in order to convert the remaining liquid into vapour. Because saturated vapour implies that it is pure vapour, there would be no liquid within the system. And latent heat is the amount of energy needed for a phase change because here we're exploiting the change of phase. We're going from a liquid phase to a vapour phase. So that's why we divide by the latent heat and not the sensible heat. 
Now we then plot the Q line, which will be given a slope of Q over Q minus 1. And this is an empirical formula that you need to remember. So when you have the value of Q, you apply it to the slope and that will give you your gradient. Now, a typical Q line uh, values tends to be that for a saturated liquid, your Q value will be 1. And for saturated vapor, your value would be 0. So therefore, the most common would be saturated liquid has a Q value of 1, so the slope is infinite. So that would be a straight up line. So this would be your saturated liquid line. If for example you have saturated vapor then you have a zero gradient so that means you have a completely horizontal straight line there is no gradient here and then for subcooled liquids that would be in the case of this line here we have a gradient that is greater than one so our q value would be in this region here and then for our mixed vapour and liquid uh, feed conditions, our Q line slope would be negative. So that would be this value here, like so. So that is for the superheated vapour system with a mixed vapour and liquid. So Q will be between 0 and 1, and that means that our slope would be negative. So that's us going down the way. Whereas when the Q value is greater than 1, we have a positive slope and the slope will be between 0 and infinity, so it will be within a 90 degree angle. And you can see that this would be the feed point here, this is the feed composition, straight up to we hit the 45 degree line, and then we apply our Q line, and that will tell us where we, our intersection with the operating line will be. Now we then set what's known as the reflux ratio, and determine the point where the extension of the top operating line, i.e. the enriching section, intersects the y-axis. Now, reflux ratio is very, very important when we talk about uh, regulating and determining the efficiency and the output of a distillation column. Because the reflux ratio, that's at the top of the column. So if we had our column here, then we have our condenser. And a reflux ratio is the amount of material that comes back into the system instead of leaving as the top product. So this value can be changed. And by changing this, this has an effect on the column's operating conditions and the output that the column will have. Now we do go into extensive detail on a distillation design in our distillation course. So if you want to learn more about that and how the, the impact reflux ratio has, then be sure to check that one out. Now our intercept will be given by this equation here. So we have the intercept is equal to the composition divided by R plus 1. Now R is the reflux ratio. We will set that. We then draw the top section operating line from the composition on the diagonal to the intercept point. We then draw the bottom operating line from the composition at the bottom uh, stream on the diagonal to the point of intersection of the Q line. And then the top section of the operating line as well. Now we can either start at XD or XB and then we step off the number of stages and we'll see how we do that when we get the, the full uh, diagram up and we'll, we'll see how we applied all of this to create that graph. So here we have our mole uh, fraction of the lighter component in the liquid phase and we have our mole fraction of the lighter component in the vapour phase. So we're talking about the, uh, the lighter component or the more volatile component. Now this is our uh, operating lines, so we have our x equals y, so that's our 45 degree line. We have our vapour liquid equilibrium line, so that's this uh, dashed line here, or curved line, sorry. Now here, this is the point, so this is your feed point, so this is the line that you would be able to plot right away, because you would know the feed conditions. So we have a composition here of 50%. So we'd be 0.5 and we draw all the way up till we hit the um, the operating line. So x equals y. Now after we perform the mass and energy balances, we get the uh, composition of the bottoms and we get the composition of the tops. And we've seen how we determine the value of the Q line. 
So here in this example, it's given us the Q line in the blue. Now what we then do is for the rectifying section, we take this point of intersection and we apply the equation that we've seen. So we had our xd over r plus 1. And when we do that, we plot from here using that gradient all the way till we get to here. Now where that intersects the Q line is where we then reach the feed tray, essentially. So anything up here is above the feed tray and anything here is below the feed tray. So from this point to that point, the green line is the rectifying section, so that's above. So the feed tray lies between plates uh, 2 and 4, so it's pretty much bang on uh, number 3. Now the purple line is your stripping section, so that's at the bottom of the column. And that goes from the point of intersection of the, the Q line with the... Um, the gradient of a rectifying section and then from that we can then draw from this point straight down to the bottom composition where it touches the XY line and then what we then do is say starting from the top we go from this point across to the equilibrium line we then touch down until we reach the rectifying section so that's the green line and then we draw across again till we touch the equilibrium line and so forth and we keep going until we reach past or on our bottom composition section. So that means that this system would require six stages, with the feed tray coming in at, feed, uh, at tray number three. So your column would look something like this. So there's your top, and this is your bottom. Now we have six trays, so that's going to be one, two, three, four, Five, and we include this as so the the reboiler and the bottom of the column is denoted by a tray in itself so this would be one two three four five and six is down here so that means that our feed would come in closer to the top than it would to the bottom so your feed point would come in here and if we change the feed composition, that will inherently, of course, change the number of trays. It could even change the position that the, the, the feed will come in on the tray. And it will change the characteristics of this, uh, the, the rectifying section and the stripping section. So again, we use the data that we are given, we apply the mass balance, and then we can create this graph. Now the feed point, as we say, should be located at the stage closest to the intersection of the operating line. So that's at this point here. So that's why we chose uh, tray 3. And the reboiler and the partial condenser, if used, act as equilibrium stages themselves. That's why we took the reboiler as a stage in itself. Now when we design a column, there is little point in reducing the estimated number of stages to account for this because they can be considered additional stages in order to ensure that we achieve the specified separation. So here, this means that that is the minimum number of trays required. It doesn't mean that we can't have more. More trays would imply, yes, the value and the cost of the column would be higher, but adding more trays increases the purity and makes sure that we reach these targets. Now the other thing that we need to note here is the minimum number of stages given by NM. And we can find this through um, the, the graph, but we also have an equation for this. And this is denoted by N lowercase m. And this corresponds to when we have a total reflux ratio when R is equal to infinity. So if R equals infinity, this will tell us that the minimum number of trays we need in order to achieve our target, this is what we will use. So this leads essentially to a situation where we have our R over R plus 1. That will inevitably cause this value to be 1. So that means it coincides with the diagonal line, because we have a gradient of 1. Now the same applies to the stripping section for the operating line. And if the relative volatility of a binary mixture is approximately constant, then we have this expression here that applies. And this can be used to calculate the number of stages when a total condenser is used. So we have it's basically a log 
plot diagram. So we have the minimum number of stages log of the compositions XD for the liquids, eh, sorry, for the top products and the bottom products, and then we have log of the average relative volatility. So that's when there are small variations within the relative volatility. So alpha D would be the relative volatility of the overhead and alpha B would be the relative volatility of the bottom product. So what we do here is we account for this by applying an average relative volatility. So we essentially multiply them together to the power a half. Now if the reflux ratio that corresponds to an infinite number of stages for a given separation, then this would correspond to the minimum vapour flow in the tower and consequently be the smallest condenser in reboiler duties. Because again, when we design these distillation columns, we are interested to know how much duty for the utilities is going to be required in order to achieve our set given targets. So again, it always comes back down to the reflux ratio. So as the reflux ratio is increased, as we can see here, the slope of the operating line is decreased as well. And this is to the point of the intersection of the operating line and the Q line. And it moves away from the diagonal towards the equilibrium line. So we had our diagonal here. So that was our x equals y. And then we had um, our equilibrium line. Now, as we change the value of r, the, the intersection starts to get closer to the equilibrium line rather than the, the operating line. So the operating line is here. If we in decrease the value of R, this intersection point gets closer and closer to the equilibrium line. The higher the value of R, the closer it gets to the operating line. And we can see that that's evident by this equation here. Now when two operating lines touch the equilibrium line, we have what's known as a pinch point. And this is the point at which the number of stages required becomes infinite. And that means that we have a, a system that is never going to be able to achieve that given set of um, conditions based on that reflux ratio. So therefore, we would have to compromise in a certain aspect of the design. But pinch technology is very, very important, and it plays a part in a lot of aspects of chemical engineering. And it's one of the, the key parts of chemical engineering that I specify in um, and specialize in uh, myself. So I highly recommend the pinch technology for things like uh, heat transfer and mass transfer. They're very, very interesting um, topics and different terminologies, so pinch technology is very, very useful, and it's a very practical um, type of analysis. So that's the end of this lesson. Thanks for watching. Hopefully this was helpful in fully understanding the McCabe Theo method. For more information, you can check out our online courses. Uh, I'll leave a link in the description. Thank you for your time, and we hope to see you in another video.